Hi everyone, thanks so much for joining us today. I'm Rosa, part of the Fertility Network team. We're delighted to be joined by a fantastic group of people who'll be answering your previously submitted questions about clinics opening safely in Scotland. Joining us today, we have um, Quality Manager Dave Wales from Edinburgh Royal, Consultant Dr Martins de Silva from Dundee Nine Wells, Consultant Dr Mahashwari and Centre Manager Alison McTavish from, McTavish from Aberdeen, Consultant Dr Helen Lyle and Lead Embryologist Joanne Leach from Glasgow Royal Infirmary. And before we start, we'd just like to thank you for all your hard work. We know the pandemic has caused much disruption and pain for everyone in your sector. And behind the scenes, you're working so hard to get everything back up and running for the patients. Thanks to everyone who sent in their questions. We know you've been through some tough weeks and your understanding, I'm sure, is greatly appreciated by the clinics and their staff. I'm now going to hand over to Dr Mahashwari from Aberdeen to give us an overview of treatment starting in Scotland. And after the presentation, our CEO, Gwenda Burns, will lead the Q&A. Hi, Dr Mahashwari, thanks for leading this. Are you ready to share your screen? Yeah, yeah perfect. Do you want to just um, uh, make, we can see that there, you're perfect. You know what I was trying to say. <laughs> uh, thank you, Rosa. And thanks very much for Infertility Network UK to providing us with the platform to share some of the work that is going on for restarting the fertility treatment in Scotland. And thank you all for joining. And thank you all for your patience. It has been a really tough time for everybody and we fully appreciate this. And in addition to needing to wait for the treatment, which you wanted to get it done much sooner than we can provide right now, um, there has been a rapidly evolving guidance Evidence have been changing at the rate of not weeks, but days and hours. So it has been a very, very tough time. But thank you again for everybody's patience. And thank you to Fertility Network UK to hosting the seminar. So just to let you know what's been happening in the Scotland, we are very lucky to be in Scotland. Um, following the announcement that um, fertility treatment will be given priority and will be started, so all the clinics in Scotland are working together, as you can see from the logos at the bottom of this slide. And we have been working not alone, the clinical team, but um, all multidisciplinary team, along with Fertility Network UK, who provides your views, as well as with Scottish government. So what we have done so far is we submitted the approval um, application to HFEA and we all got the approval. We have also agreed a joint strategy so that everybody in Scotland gets similar care. It's one Scotland approach. So whether you are in Glasgow, whether you are in Highland, everybody will get similar care and with similar policies will be followed. And the principles we have worked on so far um, on developing this uh, strategy is that we want to minimize the risk of COVID-19 infection. COVID-19 is still here and we want to minimize the risk to staff as well as to the patients. You, you have heard that uh, obviously there is a second re-blocking um, going on in Leicester, in China, in Germany, and in Melbourne now. This morning I've been made aware. So we really need to minimize the risk of infection. We also are aware that NHS has been in huge burden recently, and any treatment that we conduct should not result in undue burden for NHS. So we had to change or modify some of our policies and all the protocols had to be written. We also need informed consent from you. So all the information that we are aware of, which is, as you're aware, is constantly changing about having the treatment during when the risk of COVID is still there and getting pregnant at the time of COVID. Uh, we have to inform you of all those uh, information and we are saying to you of all those who have been already contacted the information sheet and the consent forms. As much as we want to treat everybody in the same day, we cannot do it. So we had to do some sort of prioritization policy, but in that policy has to have fair and transparent approach. So we have followed that principle in developing that strategy as well. And as you know, as I've already said, that virus is still here. So all the changes we are putting in place, we have to build resilience so that if 
Scotland was to go in second lockdown, hopefully not because Scotland risk of infection is much lower than everywhere else currently, which we are very lucky about, but we have to build in the practices to build resilience. So we have been working with multidisciplinary teams, not alone within the IVF services, but other services as well, because we don't work in isolation. So just to give you an example, such as virology, all of you know that before IVF treatments or before fertility treatments, most of the time we do blood bone virus screening. Now virology labs have been swamped with the COVID testing currently. So we have had to liaise with them as to whether they have capacity to do these tests when we start the treatments. We also had the liaison with various groups across Scotland regarding how and when we will test our patients who are undergoing fertility treatment even though they are asymptomatic for COVID testing and what is the right approach. As you know, the testing strategies across the world, not alone across the UK, have been changing again very rapidly, but we have now got the approval of how we are going to do it. We also agreed that what PPE should be used in which circumstances across the clinic so that we don't burden the NHS with the shortage of PPE already existing. We also had to liaise with anesthetist, as some of you will require anesthetic input during your egg collection and other treatments. And you know that anesthetics have been very, very busy um, managing ITU and other care when patients have been admitted with COVID. General practice also had had reduced working. So some of you may not have been referred or we need the blood test from general practice to prior to proceeding your treatment. So we had to liaise with them and urology again, if there is any male factor in fertility. So all these liaison had to go on at a national level before we can agree on a joint strategy. Similar is the case for cervical screening, as you know, routine cervical smears were stopped and we want your cervical smears to be updated. So we have come up with a strategy that even if the smear is not updated, in which conditions we can continue with the treatment and which conditions we need further information and similar approach have been used for rubella immunization or MMR vaccination. So all these things we have been doing behind the background in last 10, 11 weeks. We also need to ensure that you are safe when you come to the clinic. So we need to re reduce the risk for you. We cannot ever eliminate it, but we are doing everything to minimize it. So the new normal will be that everybody will have remote consultations and some of you are already having the remote consultations. And we'll be relying on you to tell us your weight, height, and smoking status, which used to be um, done at the clinic, but it will be rechecked at the first appointment in the face-to-face -face clinic appointments. We are also practicing social distancing as everywhere else, which means that the reduced number of patients at one time can be there at the clinic. Staff working patterns had been modified as well to accommodate all these practices. We are asking you about the triage questions at every opportunity. So you will be asked these questions, I'm afraid, again and again, but this is for your safety. We are also working on consents, which are electronic because paper consents do carry a risk, but that process is going on through procurements and hopefully we will have electronic consents uh, in near future. And we also are asking, as I said previously, uh, extra consent forms prior to your treatment during these times. So a lot of things have been put in place to ensure that you are safe because your safety is of paramount importance for us. We want to treat you, but we want to treat you safely. We have continued throughout the pandemic, remote consultations, whether it's be by email, whether it's by video consultations, or whether it's by uh, phone calls. And our counselors have been working and working very hard because we also all appreciate that it has been very, very difficult time for everybody and all of you. Um, also behind the scenes, all those who have got any gametes or embryos in storage with us in any of the clinics, they have all been looked after, regular audits have been con conducted and all the monitorings as need to happen have been happening. So, Behind the scenes, the lab teams have been working very hard to ensure all that is being done. We have also continued with urgent fertility preservation, those cancer cases who are about to lose their fertility because of uh, cancer treatments or chemotherapy or radiotherapy. 
they have been continued to be treated. So on basis of all this, what we have worked out is a gradual risk assessed reintroduction of the cervix. And it had to be gradual because of all the things I've already mentioned. We are risk assessing every day, every single process is being reassessed and reassessed and we are doing minor modifications. So the first treatment which is starting or the, the first phase is frozen embryo transfer which as you know, does not require you to have multiple visits, does not require you to have injections or monitorings, and it does not carry the risk of ovarian hyperstimulation. So all the principles I mentioned that we want to reduce you coming to hospital, we want to reduce the burden to NHS, does fulfill that. And if there was a need of sudden lockdown again, then it can be switched on and off at very quickly, hopefully not. And similarly, with the donor insemination treatment, using natural cycle, we can do that in the phase one based on the same principles. Now, when we start on phase two, we will be having stimulations for the fresh cycle, but we have prioritized older women. And there is a lot of data. We have done the data analysis on large data sets and found that this is the age group where the maximum decline in the fertility will happen if we were to delay the treatment any further. So we'll prioritize those women. And we also then in the phase two will be the tablets uh, if we are giving you for producing eggs. Again, these require minimal monitoring. That's why we put it in phase two. Followed by this, we will go on to start stimulation for all other patients and ovulation induction. Injections have been put in phase three because they will require Will not your position in the waiting list will not be compromised. You can delay the treatment up until six months. And again, this will all be part of the consenting process. Those who are shielding at present or have significant comorbidities like other medical illness where the risk of infection will be high, we will speak to you and advise you that we will delay your treatment. Uh, sorry, I'm really sorry. Just to interrupt you a second, we lost you for about 30 seconds. So I don't know if you could go back a little bit for us. That would be great. Okay. Do you want me to go back to previous slide or this one? No, I, uh, actually, yes, it was the previous slide. Yeah. Okay. But it was just the last sort of 30 seconds of it. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Thanks, Rosa, for mentioning. So I don't know what happened there. Apologies for that. Um, so as I say, in phase three, we'll be starting stimulation for fresh cycle for all other patients, as well as ovulation inductions using gonadotrophin injections. Um, we put that in phase three because you require multiple visits to hospital for monitoring in those cases. So you will have some questions which will be answered by panel, but there are some which we'll be able to answer, uh, which we think you will have, is that if you do not wish to go ahead with the treatment at present, as you are obviously concerned about having treatment at present time when there is risk for COVID, that is absolutely fine. And um, you can delay your treatment up until six months to see um, and we'll review the situation after that time. So I, this will be part of the consenting process. Those who are shielding or those who have comorbidities um, such as medical illness, and again, there is a risk assessment being drafted who, um, which is agreed by all the clinics that will assess your risks. And if your risks are high at this time, then we will speak to you. Again, this all will not compromise your position in the waiting list. All this time will be taken in consideration. But as I say, we, will, we are happy for you to defer the treatment for six months without compromising your position in the waiting list. If your treatment was stopped in the middle due to COVID, then you will be in the priority list and the phases, as I've mentioned previously, you will be called in those phases. Some of you may have already been contacted. If you are on waiting list and if your referral is delayed because your GPs are not doing routine services or you haven't gone to your GP or your gynecologist, then um, what, we are going, what we have agreed is that if you're already on the waiting list and we are aware that this time 
we have not done any treatments, which is from 17th of March in Scotland, then whenever we contact you, that time will be added to your full excess of the treatment journey, not just for the forthcoming cycle. However, we have to ensure that all other NHS criteria are met. And this is the case for both if you are under 40 or if you are between 40 and 42. So this time will be added to your entitlement. So do not worry that if this time we haven't treated you, um, that you'll lose your entitlement. If there has been a delay to go on waiting list because um, as I mentioned previously, you have not gone to your GP or your um, gynecologist haven't referred you or um, your GP haven't referred you at present because they are not doing routine work. Anybody who is referred between 1st of March 2020 to 31st of August 2020 will have six months added to their age eligibility criteria, provided it is clinically appropriate to do so. So that benefit will be added on. Uh, so don't worry again if you haven't been referred yet. There has been a lot of support being provided um, because we know it has been very, very tricky time. So there have been counselors, as I mentioned, they're working across all clinics. They're doing remote consultations. So please do um, use their services. Fertility Network here Duke, UK are doing a grand job. And thanks for hosting this webinar again, Gwenda and Rosa. Um, and they are continuing to support you. There is also support available from clinics via telephones, emails, and we have done regular website updates. All of us have increased the staff who are answering your telephone calls and emails. And we do plan to do regular webinars uh, such as this. So thank you very much, everybody, for your support. We are all in it together. We are all learning something new every day. And eventually, we'll all get there together if we work together towards the same goal. Thank you very much. So I'd just like to say a huge thank you for that. I think it was really informative. I think it will have given people much more clarity. Um, I would like to reiterate before we move on to the questions that were already submitted, we can't take questions today. Um, it just wouldn't be feasible and it wouldn't uh, we wouldn't have the time to be able to do that. And also the questions that have come in that are general are about the whole of Scotland, so Scotland moving together. So regardless whether Glasgow, Aberdeen, Dundee or Edinburgh are answering the question, they're unified in their approach in, in moving on. Um, again, thank you. The presentation was absolutely um, great. So we'll move on to the first question um, and we'll go to Alison McTavish in Aberdeen. Um, and the first question is, should patients who were due for their first aid collection contact the NHS clinic? Thank, thank you, Gwenda, for giving me the opportunity to answer these questions. These questions are so important and everybody that's listening into this that's waiting out there for treatment, we appreciate that you really want to speak to us right now and we really want to speak to you as well. However, if you all phone, then we're going to be in a bit of a, a mess here. So what we would ask you to do, I think as um, Ab has already mentioned in her presentation, is please continue with the patients that you've shown so far. And we, we are getting a high number of calls and we are contacting patients as quickly as we can with, with information. And I know that's been really challenging just now um, because everybody wants a timeline. We all operate in timelines. And what we're trying to do just now is to put timelines in place so that when we do get back in touch with you, we can give you fairly accurate information as to how we can move on. So please wait, wait for us to phone you, email you, or contact you by letter. That's how all of us are, are operating to make sure to make, we're, make the best use of time for everybody, yourselves, ourselves, and that we can move on as quickly as possible. Does that answer the question, do you think, Gwenda? No, that's great. That's, that's great, Alison, thank you. Um, and on to question two, if we can come to Dr. Lyle. If 
AMH bloods were taken and consent forms had been given, where do this group fit into the process? And also, how long are a AMH um, tests and sperm analysis valid for? Um, thanks, Gwenda. I'm actually going to pass that one on to Joanne because it's a slightly more lab-based question and I'll take um, the questions later if that's okay. Yeah, no, that's great. Hi there. Um, so if you've had an AMH uh, test done or a semen analysis carried out, we would um, uh, say that that result was valid for, for 12 months uh, and in 12 months time we would be looking to repeat that. Um, in terms of consent, um, consent is something that we review at uh, the start of each cycle. Um, so if you have completed consent also, then we would be reviewing those and amending them or updating them um, if they're required prior to the start uh, of your uh, cycle of treatment. Um, uh, in terms of uh, where you would be um, and the process, we are uh, contacting all patients at this point in time who had appointments organised that were cancelled. So some of you may have heard from us already um, and if you haven't please have, have some patience with us. Thank you. We'll thank be contacting you to, to rearrange and reschedule those appointments. Thank you, that's great Joanne. Um, and to go on to question three, um, if I could go over to Dundee to Dr Martins de Silvia. Um, if you have a frozen embryo, but we're not booked in for your NHS cycle pre-COVID, should you be contacting the clinic to book in a transfer? So I think Abba's already said, um, what we're trying to do is stepwise reintroduce treatment in a sort of fair and transparent way. So the first group of patients that have been prioritised for frozen embryo transfer would be those where their, pay, uh, where their treatment was interrupted during the COVID um, uh, shutdown. And then what we all hope is that treatment will then resume um, and, and, and pick up the waiting list from there on. So if you're expecting to hear from us, I guess this is going to be a similar message to the other clinics that have already spoken ahead of me. Bear with us, be patient, we'll be in touch with you as soon as we can and we'll give you as accurate inf information and indication of treatment when we're ready to go ahead. Great, thank you. Um, and if I could go back to Alison at Aberdeen, um, if you had a failed round and would li like to start another fresh, but you'll be changing protocol, could the paperwork be done now so it doesn't delay when restarting treatment? Okay, right. So um, that's quite a complicated question there, isn't it? Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, okay, so you've had a fail. So, well, I'm, I'm sorry that um, cycles have, have, have failed. Um, that's always a distressing factor. But what we are trying to do in the centre just now, we've, we've all got lists of patients and I think as um, Dr. Martins de Silva has mentioned in Dundee, that um, we're, we're working through the list and what we're doing is going through patients and setting things up to make sure that we know what needs to be done. So we are working behind the scenes that um, we have the documentation, we have the right protocols in place for you so it should have no impact at all on restarting your treatment everything we, we are gearing up to get people through as, as quickly as we possibly can so we're doing a lot of preparation beforehand and um, we're going through files medical records making sure we've got everything in place and um, so that when there's either a medical consultation or a nursing consultation or indeed both for, for some patients Everything is there, ready to be picked up and um, discussed with with you all, all the patients, um, to make sure we're all on the same page. So no, don't don't worry, um, it won't delay any any restart at all. Thank you, Alison. Thanks. That's great. Um, and to go back to Glasgow, if that's okay, patients with severe endometriosis who are at the top of the waiting list. Will they be a priority for NHS treatment? Um, thanks, Gwenda. I, I'll take that one. Um, no, and um, they won't. Um, what we've been doing is prioritising those patients who had their treatment cancelled at the start of the pandemic, and they'll be the ones asked to come forward for treatment first. Um, 
after that, the plan would be to go back to our waiting list and to treat patients in the order that they're on the waiting list. So we, we do understand it's a very anxious time for patients. Um, but for those who are at the top of the waiting list, we'll be in touch in due course um, to advise them about booking their treatment. Great, thank you. Um, and to go next to Edinburgh, to Dave Wales, um, is there any indication of wait times or new deferrals for NHS IVF? Hi, Glenda. Uh, I just want to double check you can hear me. That's good. We had some technical difficulties earlier. So in terms of waiting times, all the NHS fertility centres in Scotland are committed to doing patient treatment within 12 months of referral. At the time of the centres closing due to the COVID pandemic, centres were averaging about between six and nine months across Scotland. Uh, as all the centres were closed for over three months while we prepared to reopen, the waiting time for treatment will be extended by at least as many months. So this will push some of us back to the 12 month mark. Obviously this will vary between centres. Uh, in order to operate safely with respect to physical distancing, to protecting patients, staff and the NHS as a whole, uh, we had to start small, as my colleagues have already alluded to. This means working with less staff and fo focusing on those treatments with the lowest associated risks as well as those who are cancelled partway through their treatments already. So as no centre will be able to work at full capacity during the early phases of reopening, and given the uncertainty of a second wave, we have been unable to anticipate what the new waiting time will be, as we continue to lose grounds of those waiting times in the early stages. So over the next few months, we're hoping that treatment in each centre will start to stabilise, giving us a new normal and a more accurate waiting time for our patients. So, to keep everybody else updated, we'll of course keep our own websites up to date. And patients who have managed the waiting list either before, during, or after the closures will be contacted by their local centre when they reach the top of their respective waiting lists. Yeah, that, that's, that's great. And I, th I think, um, you know, it's very clear in Scotland um, across the board that nobody wants to have um, any longer waiting time than absolutely necessary. Um, so if I, if I could also ask you, Dave, what will the process be for self-funding patients either already on the list or who have a frozen embryo and would like to have a transfer? And will they be treated in the same way as NHS patients waiting on um, frozen embryo transfers? Of course. Uh, so those patients who were self-funding who have already been seen within the clinic or have sperm, eggs, or even embryos in storage, will be treated exactly the same as NHS patients in terms of waiting time. Uh, this does mean though that some centres may not be able to take on new self-funded patients at this point in time, due to their commitments to the NHS patients and materials already in storage, but they'll not be disadvantaged. Okay, that's great. And one more um, for, for you, Dave. Um, process for those who went straight to a frozen transfer for PGT and still have to get a biopsy scheduled? Um, just what the process around that is just now? So this would be very similar to any other process. So the PGT service has an extra kind of asset to it, I suppose. It's dependent on two things, sufficient capacity within the embryology lab and the continued availability of molecular genetic services. So we do rely on another department for this. I'm pleased to say that both Glasgow and Edinburgh who offer the PGT service have announced that they're both able to now carry on that service, obviously focusing on those ones with frozen material already. So there should be no change. Okay, that's great. Thank you. And just to come back to Dundee and Dr. Max and Sylvia, um, if you were um, going private, how would this affect your place on the NHS waiting list? And can you transfer your NHS screening test to the private sector? Um, okay, so yes, you can self-fund whilst you're on an NHS waiting list. And if you continue to meet the NHS criteria, if that treatment was unsuccessful, then you wouldn't affect your NHS eligibility in any way. I think Dave has already alluded to the fact that the four NHS IVF centres may be unable to take on uh, new self-funded cases but if you wanted to transfer your care to the private sector then you can request your notes the normal way I think there's a, 
a, a turnaround time of up to 30 days for the notes with all your treatment um, records or, or screening tests or whatever within it. Thank you. And patients who are care workers or nurses, nurses who cannot guarantee they have not been in contact with COVID, will they be required to self-isolate prior to starting treatment and can I ask Alison in Aberdeen that one? Yes, you can. <laughs> um, yeah. At the, at the moment, um, we are very much following the, the Scottish Government um, guidelines and we're not asking patients to self-isolate. Also, um, I'd like to thank whoever asked that question um, for all their work during this, this crisis, if they've been working in care homes or, or um, in any medical setting. Uh, so please don't, don't worry that that will be, um, cause any inconvenience to you picking up your treatment. Um, with COVID, things have changed so so dramatically, and I think Ava has mentioned that already Leicester's gone back into lockdown. So we have to be able to react to whatever information we have been given at the time. So the information from Scottish Government um, guidance is our main source of how we are going to proceed, and I think we've been given good information to date. So as long as everyone continues to um, do what's asked of them. Uh, take any necessary infection control procedures and protect themselves and their family, we should not be having to ask anyone to self-isolate. Thank you. Okay, that's great, thank you. And just following on from that one, and one that we hope obviously won't happen again as a countrywide anyway, and um, I'd like to just put this over to Glasgow as to what would happen if there was a second wave. Um, well, I certainly would agree, Gwenda, we would hope that wouldn't be the case. But if that did happen, we would just have to reassess our services again in the same way as we did um, when the first wave happened and also take all available advice from the regulator, the HFA and the Scottish Government and work together nationally as we've done um, this time. Okay, thank, thank you all. Um, thank you um, Dr Mishwari for the amazing presentation and thank you for taking the time today to answer questions. I know that some people still have questions and we couldn't do it all in the one session. It is an evolving situation and perhaps this is something that we can revisit as time goes on. Um, so I'd just like to say a huge thank you to everyone for taking part and especially giving your time because your clinical time is precious at the moment. Um, I would also like to thank everyone who's joined the webinar and please remember if you need any support, advice or information to get in touch with Fertility Network. Um, and we hope to speak and see you all very soon. So from everybody here, we would just like to say bye for now.